Our scripture this morning is found in Matthew 21, verses 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner, a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvesting time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent a son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this, heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, draw especially near and speak this word of Scripture to us. May it challenge us, but may it be good news to us this morning. May it challenge us, and may it be good news this morning. To your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' time, this was a real-life situation. He was talking to the chief priests, the Pharisees. He was talking to them about something they could relate to. This was a real-life situation in Roman-occupied Palestine with its scattered territories throughout the land. Landowner has a vineyard, really nice vineyard. It's cool, with a fence, wine press, watchtower. He leaves to go to another country and puts tenants in charge. He then sends his people to collect his produce. But the tenants don't give the landowner what is his. And despite the landowner sending repeated people to get his produce, the tenants keep beating them up. So finally, the guy figures, I'll send my son. They know who he is. They'll treat him right. But no, they figure that if they take care of the son, it will all be theirs. Jesus asks, now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Now, this is a setup because the religious leadership, being wealthy people and relating very closely in the story to the owner of the vineyard, they answer, he will put, they answer, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give them the produce at harvest time. This reminds me of a story in the Old Testament. The prophet's name is Nathan. And Nathan goes in to see King David. And he has to tell King David a tragic story. And the tragic story is this. 
There was once upon a, there's this guy in your kingdom who has all these sheep and all this stuff and he went out and he took a poor man's sheep and instead of using all his own sheep, he took this poor man's only sheep and he killed him and took it from him. King David said, whoever that is, they deserve to be punished. Nathan says to King David, you are the man. That was the situation with Bathsheba. In a similar way, Jesus is pronouncing to these religious leaders that they are, they are the people who they're talking about. That they are the ones. Here in this parable, the landowner represents God. The vineyard represents the kingdom of God. The tenants are the religious leaders. The slaves are the prophets. The son is Jesus Christ. And the new tenants are the church. And there are a lot of audiences. There are a lot of audiences in this parable. There's the original audience. Then Matthew was writing this in the 60s and 70s of the first century. He's writing this after the temple has been destroyed, after all the religious leadership is gone. He's speaking this to a possible new church. He's saying to these people, and there's another audience, there's us this morning. Do you want to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ? And there's three particular points in this parable, and I've been struggling with this all week. So I want to put it out there right. I want to put it out there as a challenge, and at the same time, I want it to be good news to us as we receive from the Lord's table this morning. I believe this parable teaches us three things about God and three things about the kingdom. The first is this. God is patient. God is patient. God gives us wiggle room. Thank God for that. The story demonstrates the Lord has enormous patience. But there are limits to the Lord's patience. Second thing this teaches us. We have been given responsibility. It's not just a parable about them. It's a parable about us, as well as Matthew, St. Matthew's original audience. This is a parable about stewardship. That word gets thrown around an awful lot, stewardship. Some people say steward, stewards, like stewards root beer. It's not spelled that way. Steward. And a steward in the church, it means managing God's stuff on God's behalf. And as stewards, the first part is what we've been entrusted with. And the second is what in the world we are supposed to do with it. When God expects fruit and doesn't get it, the results are not good. Each of us, in the church, we've been entrusted with the gospel as well as what God has given to each of us. We are renters of everything and owners of nothing. God owns everything. Years ago, I sat in Pastor Jerry Falwell's church and I remember Jerry Falwell talking about recently Ronald Reagan had passed away, President Ronald Reagan, and he <coughs> died of Alzheimer's disease, which is no respecter of persons. He died in a fetal position. And then not that long after that, Jerry Falwell died sitting at his desk. Neither of these great men took anything with them, except, of course, what they had given away. Jerry Falwell had a model, though, in his ministry. 
And it was this. If it's Christian, it ought to be better. If it's Christian, it ought to be better. Meaning there's an excellence that Jesus Christ calls us all to. And I want to share a little bit more about that excellence in a couple, just a few, a few moments. What we do with what we have is important. Here's the big question. What kind of tenets are we in God's kingdom? What kind of tenets are we in God's kingdom? Many years ago, I went to a missions meeting for a large denomination. doesn't matter which one. I was seeking funding for my prison ministry. This is 20-some years ago. And you know what really amazed me was how much money they were spending on themselves just to kind of keep their thing, just to kind of keep their thing going. Also, many years ago, when I had the fish market, Two doors away was a Christian bookstore, which helped me connect very much to the Lord. The Christian bookstore is in another location. Still exists today in Jamesburg, New Jersey. A friend of mine had just gotten paid. He had, he had cashed his check. He had it in the pay envelope. He put it down in the Christian bookstore. The owner of the Christian bookstore found it. And this is what she said to my friend. When she handed him the pay envelope with every nickel and every dime and every penny and every dollar bill in it. She said, you need to be more careful with the Lord's money. Once I had a conversation with a special Christian leader about tithing. Temper said to me, to God, he pointed to me and said, it's not yours, it's his. Verse 41, God still wants tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. First thing, God is patient. Second thing, we have responsibility. Third thing that this parable tells us, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. This is from Psalm 118, 22 uh, through 23. It's from the Psalm. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Now, if you look in your Bible, there are different translations. Some say Jesus is the cornerstone. Other translations say Jesus is the capstone, meaning he's on top. Others translations say he is the keystone. My response to that is yes, indeed. He's at the base, he's in the middle, and he's on the top. Amen. What does Jesus as the cornerstone, the capstone, the keystone what does it mean? And that's when it hit me in the middle of the night. The cornerstone, the capstone, the keystone of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. It comes down to a four-letter word, love. L-O-V-E. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In the kingdom of God, what kind of tenants will we be? I believe that tenantship starts with the presence of Christ. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, draw me close. Jesus, be near to me. And no matter where we are. Now, years ago, and I confess I've told you this before, but a dear, a dear relative of uh, Bill Smith's brother-in-law, okay, had a, a brain tumor. And you know what we bragged about him at his funeral? Was everywhere he went, he was an emissary of God. Everywhere he went, he took Jesus with him. Wow. To be emissaries of love. You know, that can be in a fantastic way like Mother Teresa. In the Los Angeles Times, there was a story recently about a Korean young man, 26 years old, went over to be an ambassador of peace in Japan. If you know the story of Korea and Japan, there's a great deal of enmity between those nations. 
And this Korean young man was in the subway station, and an elderly Japanese man, he had had too much to drink, he went down on the train tracks, and the 26-year-old Korean lad, he went down, got the, the older Japanese man up, and then he himself got hit by the train, and he gave his life. That had so much impact in Japan that the Prime Minister attended this Korean young man's funeral. It had so much impact because it was a story of love. And that's the question this morning. How will you and I, how will we live the story of Christ's love? in our lives. That's the cornerstone. That's the keystone. That's the capstone that we are called to live. May Jesus Christ be the cornerstone, the capstone, the keystone of each of our lives. May it be so.